Welcome everybody. Um, like you can see, our presentation is called Doomsday Scenarios that we hope we're preventing. And um, we hope to tell you a little bit more about this. So I'm gonna start telling you about what the DIVD is and how it started. It started in 2019 by Astrid, Victor and Chris, who are all here. So can we get a little applause for them? Yeah. And they started this with a dream to make the internet safer. So that dream led to a mission statement. We aim to make the digital world safer by reporting vulnerabilities we find in digital systems to the people who can fix them. We have a global reach, but we do it in a Dutch style, open, honest, collaborative, and for free. So how is that going? Well, since 2019, we've grown a lot. We have a serious management team, uh, various departments. We have our own IT department that's uh, responsible for our own infrastructure. We are starting by HR departments to manage the over 100 volunteers that have since joined our organization. We have a communications department and so on. It's really starting to become a serious organization. And we have some impressive feats in that time. We made global news as the institute that disclosed the zero days in Kaseya that were eventually used by our evil in what some people claim to be the largest ransomware attack in history, but that's absolutely debatable if it was. Um, we've published disclosures that led to uh, questions being asked in the Dutch parliament. We were name dropped in 2021 at Black Hat Vegas by, uh, the, in the keynote of Jan Easterly from CISA. And recently the Dutch justice and security minister has said that we are allowed and capable of doing things that they simply can't. And that with that, we're a very important organization for um, the cybersecurity infrastructure in the Netherlands. So during this talk, we'll sometimes say things about how broken things are, how bad something could be exploited. And I really want to remind all of you, we're the volunteer firefighters on the internet. We promise we're not evil. So when I talk about this could absolutely have been broken, etc., we're not the guys that's gonna do that. So in those cases, remember, Kind people, firefighters. So I'll first introduce myself. My name is Leonard Outsorn. I'm a hacker and a hack not crime advocate. Um, in my day job, I work as a security analyst at Zerocopter, where I get to see some of the coolest reports of some of the best hackers in the world, triage them, and work with our customers to uh, remediate those. And then in my free time, I work as head of C-Cert at the day for day, where I, well, working with hackers, coordinating hackers, is sometimes hurting cats, as many of you will know. But we try to keep it a little bit structured, run our cases, and have an organization that works. Uh, if you want to know more about me, you can find me on Twitter, handles on the screen. And I'm doing this presentation together with Ralf Horn, who will now introduce himself. <laughs> well, I'm Ralf. Um, at Dave Day, I'm a team lead for F1 cases, which essentially means the big open cases with well-known vulnerabilities. And in my day job, I work at Instant Response in Northwave, and I really like doing things in the curated intelligence community. So, what evil lurks in the dark? For those who are unfamiliar with what the internet looks like, we picked out a few. This is not an exhaustive list. You can have comments on this list. Um, we've talked a bit about crime groups, initial access brokers, ransomware, a bit of activism. So. Thank you very much, Solder, for these <laughs> very kind pictures. Um, so initial access brokers, essentially they're financially motivated, as all criminals are. They sell access on forums, or they sell it privately to um, either stately actors or ransomware groups. They pretty much use anything that works, which can be credential phishing, can be phishing with malware, such as Qbot, or brute force and exposed services, or whatever is the flavor of today. And we have ransomware. I think everyone pretty much knows ransomware. They're financially motivated. They will encrypt, steal your data, pretty much extort you. Payment is often done in cryptocurrency, or is done in cryptocurrency, such as BTC or Monero. Um, they will obtain access themselves, or they will just buy access depending on the group. And they move laterally in your domain to pretty much own everything that's Windows and, well, <laughs> then encrypt it. Um, now we have a bit of hacktivism. It's often politically motivated. Actual skill also widely varies. 
um, they can be more determined than, for example, the Axel's group, because they have a, uh, a cause to fight for, um, and they're often not financially motivated. So, as Dave Day, we scan a lot on the internet. Um, so what does the wild, web, uh, the, wild wide, uh, the wild wild web look like? Who knows? This picture. The one hand going <laughs> up? Anyone else? It's a uh, bit disappointing. Who knows this picture? picture? She's seen the talk. This picture must be more familiar. And then, uh, and then we know this picture, and then everyone pretty much knows it. So exchange, what is it? Um, it's pretty much a mail server. It's on-prem by Microsoft. It's absolutely broken and you should not use it. Um, it's used heavily by companies that did not want or could move to the cloud um, or to Office 365. And you have a, a researcher by the name of Orange Tsai who published a bunch of vulnerabilities. Um, first one starting on 2nd of March. Um, and we started scanning on the 3rd of March. And well, exchanges are pretty much easy to exploit if you either have credentials or if it's just outdated enough. So what's the problem with it? Uh, a proxy pre of RCE chain, which essentially means you can get remote code execution on a mailbox. Um, and exchanges, when this all dropped and started, they were often exposed on the internet in a way that they should not be exposed on the internet, like this. So on the 3rd of March, 2021, you can see that there's over 40,000 exchange servers that are vulnerable to the original vulnerability in exchange or well, um, proxy logon. You can see people are starting to patch a few days later, and then a new scanning method is developed and we found even more vulnerable servers. And when you think of this, this is potentially over 40,000 companies that have an exchange server that's used by ransom or that can be used by ransomware actors to get access to your network and they will encrypt it and they will use it. And you're thinking this was 2021 and we had some vulnerabilities also in 2022. Is it still relevant? Yes, it is. Uh, our SSRF, this new one, um, found, I believe, uh, originally by the Play Ransomware group, they use it a lot to exploit things such as Rackspace. So yeah, you might want to not want to expose this thing on the internet or at least pretty much patch it. Let's talk about more fun things. <laughs> so who read the news about the ESXi ransomware? Uh, <laughs> 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 yeah, <laughs> you read it. Um, here's the news article. So what's wrong with ESXi on the internet? Pretty much a lot. So you almost have 15K vulnerable ESXi hosts on the internet that had open SOP exposed that can be used or could be used by a ransomware actor to exploit CVE 2021-21974. Um, currently, there have been two ransomware waves, or at least in the recent month, and uh, there have been ones before. So what's the true problem? There are hosts on the internet that are unable to upgrade. They have a vulnerable version that's pinned by their either their Dell server or maybe their service provider, such as OVH or Hetzner. Um, so this creates a weird situation where your customer will have two pop-ups. Please patch. No, you cannot patch because you're locked to this version. Internet is broken. <laughs> Let's talk about more broken things. <laughs> Log for shell. Well, <laughs> thank you, Axel, for this picture. Um, log for shell what's wrong with it? Uh, pretty much a lot. You can find it in everything. Uh, you had uh, several CVEs originally, um, and this dropped, and it was in everything. So to quote a certain someone from Dave Day, <laughs> thank you, Frank, log for j is like sugar. It's in everything, even in things you don't expect, like this. So yeah, some people thought it was funny to put a GNDI payload on an RFID scanner. <laughs> and it's rigged. So let's talk about like what could be exploited. <laughs> RFID-based access systems, mobile device management, I'll get back to that one, hypervisors, digital workspace platforms, and 
Most of these have also been used as initial access for ransomware, but also for APT groups. And especially the MDM one, we found pretty interesting at day to day. Um, we found a mobile device management of a major Western telecom provider, several, that was exposed to the internet that managed their internal network. Well, pretty much an easy way to take this over. Let's talk about more fun things. Yeah, this one was uh, particularly fun for us. I think some of you may have heard about Kaseya. Uh, and in case you've heard about it but don't exactly know what it is, Kaseya is, uh, the product is called Kaseya VSA, which stands for Virtual System Administrator. And it's used by MSPs to remotely manage their clients. So with vulnerability in this product, you can potentially hit many endpoints that are managed by this single version of this product. So what was actually wrong with it? Um, these are zero days, well, no longer zero days because they've been disclosed since, but these are vulnerabilities that are found by Wietse Boonstra, one of the day day researchers. Um, so what did he find? These are the seven initial CVEs that we found in there, a credential leak and business logic flow, some good old SQL injection, remote code execution, some cross-site scripting, a 2FA bypass, a local file inclusion, an XML external entity vulnerability. So yeah, pretty much a lot of different vulnerabilities in a single product. There was absolutely a lot wrong with this. And while each of them is absolutely very critical already and can be abused, we came up with a way to change some of them to yeah, have an even more uh, impactful exploit. So there are two, the end goal for this project would be reaching the uh, VSA task list. Because using this, we could deploy tasks to the hosts that were being managed and thus not only attack the server itself, but attack all the endpoints it was managing. And we found two ways initially to reach it. Obviously, the unauthenticated remote code execution is just, yeah, go and game over. And then we had uh, an authentication bypass and then an authenticated SQL injection, which would also lead us to the same point. And once you reach the task list, you can just deploy commands to the endpoints, tell them to pop calc or drop ransomware. And yeah, that led us to, this is very broken, but how bad is this on the internet? So we did some baseline scans while in the process of the disclosure of the vendor. We're like, okay, so there's roughly 2,300 systems online. And then this happened. 2nd of July on a Friday, uh, start of the 4th of July weekend in America, so a lot of people are not really working, partying on boats, lighting fireworks, American things. And then a ransom ransomware gang thought, hey, that's a good time to do this. So they launched a ransomware attack against Casey and of the 2400 ho of the 2300 hosts that we were seeing online, they only affected 60 direct customers of Kaseya. But as I explained earlier, you can then affect the endpoints <laughs> behind that, which means that downstream, up to 1,500 victims were affected, even though only 60 direct customers were affected. So in that sense, this attack on a product like this is really a force multiplier for an attacker. Um, well, with the 1,500 downstream customers affected, they were demanding $70 million for a universal decryptor that would help all the victims. And from that 70 million number is also where a lot of people estimate like, oh, this is the biggest ransomware attack ever because biggest ransom demand. Um, of course, this happening while we were already in the process of disclosing to the vendor made us ask, did our disclosure get compromised somewhere? Maybe Kaseya was hacked and it was disclosed on their end or have we been under attack? Has any communication been intercepted? So. Luckily, there was some analysis of their actual attack, and they used different vulnerabilities than we did. They did use the same authentication bypass, but after that, they used a file upload and a local file inclusion to again reach the same task list and deploy their ransomware. So we're quite happy with that because it's, yeah, if they had known all the vulnerabilities we had, they would have used an easier attack than the path that they took. So then, how does remediation adaption go in such a case? Well, Kaseya was absolutely world news, so you see a massive drop in systems online. Like, overnight, you see the big drop, and then 
a couple of days to a week later, it's pretty much gone. Um, the attack started on a Friday evening, and as day for day, we're very proud of the result that by Sunday, all the systems in the Netherlands, at least, were offline. So that brings us to the question, are we actually helping? We're trying to measure impact because we scan and then we notify as soon as possible, which means that often we don't really have historical data about patch adoption. We don't know with what kind of trend the vulnerable systems on the internet were already going down before we sent our notifications. So it's hard to tell if our notifications have really changed anything. Luckily, we recently called a break on this issue. And it was with this case. Uh, Jan Hoof from Fox IT published a blog post about two CVEs um, in Citrix and measuring the version adoption on the internet. So in this case, they had the historical data and they were willing to share both their fingerprinting method and the historical data with us. Um, the vulnerabilities that this is about are an unauthorized access to gateway user capabilities and an, again, an unauthenticated remote code, arbitrary remote code execution. FoxIT had a very benign fingerprint based on hashes, so it was for us very low impact on the systems to scan them. And they had historical data that we were uh, very happy about, as you'll see in the next few slides. Because here we see the remediation adoption. Um, we'll zoom in on the graphs a bit later, because I understand that you can barely see this. Uh, the first line is uh, when Citrix published their patch blog, and you see things start going down. Then we have a graph with a few more lines. The blue line in the middle is when Fox IT's blog post came out, and the green line at the end is when David Day notifications came out. So let's see how this was adopted in a few countries. Let's start with the adoption here in the Netherlands. You can clearly see a trend breaking and things going down after we've notified. We can see the same in the United Kingdom. It's already slowly going down, our notifications go out, and then there's an uptick, and it goes down slightly faster. Switzerland did even better. They really like listening to us, apparently. So thank you, people in Switzerland. And the same can be said for Canada. That's very impressive, uh, we thought. We were very happy with these results. Of course, sadly, this does not work everywhere. The French were not as listening to our uh, notifications, as you can see. But for us, this is also a lesson learned. So we can now go and look why doesn't France listen? Is it because all the systems are at OVH and they refuse to put our notices through to the admins of the systems? Or are the French just not willing to read any email that's not sent in French? <laughs> Could be, but this way we can learn how we can reach these people better and yeah, how to clean up the internet in an even more efficient way. And then, uh, Talking about doing things better, I think Ralph had a few points about uh, what he believes could absolutely be done better. Yeah, so what can we do better? Like, surely we can do better as a community. So surely nobody would ever hook up a vSphere to the internet. I mean, why would you? This, what does it add? Free yeah, exactly. Backdoor. <laughs> free backdoors, yeah, well, free malware. Well, yeah, we get to that. Uh, expose their F5 management interface to the internet when critical CFEs get published, like every two to three months. Um, or, well, expose RDP to the internet. Um, or maybe wait two and a half years before patching. We've seen that one. We have, to, we have the details for that one. Actually, I think we've sadly seen all of these ones. <laughs> yeah, that's true, actually. Um, and also, maybe you shouldn't build a professional remote access gateway product on a BSD version that's A, not supported, uh, and B, use Perl to do everything with it. Um, yeah. <laughs> Pretty much this. Um, so what can we do better? Um, either allow a list us or please don't block us. Um, yeah, this is the IS that we're scanning from. So yeah. if you want to get notifications from us, please put it on the allow list. Don't block us. And if you get a notification for us and we're right, please do something. If we're wrong, please let us know so we can adjust our methods and use that to correctly identify other victims. Yeah. So yeah. Thank you. Questions, discussion, or maybe some awkward silence. We can also do that.
Somebody should ask a question because Rolf really wants to throw the thing. <laughs> Sorry. I was just going to ask if you could please put that uh, IP range back on the screen. I'll yeah, sure. Wasn't done finishing. <laughs> it's also on our website. It's in the footer. If you go to oh, okay. dave.day.nl oh, okay. in the footer, you'll see our AS um, or our netblock in our ASN. So just Any question, more questions? Or does anyone have an idea on maybe what you think we could do better? Over there. <laughs> this ought to be fun. <laughs> so the question is, what is the worst case doomsday scenario <laughs> that you can imagine? Um, doomsday scenario? Yeah. Uh, I think for me that would be the Kaseya case had it been exploited better. Because at our initial look, we were like, the impact of this could be insane. And then in the end, while it was still very impactful and very big, only 60 direct customers of Kaseya were affected. And that already meant 1,500 downstream victims. So imagine if they had prepared a little better and hit all 2,300 systems that were on the internet. Kaseya with Intune. Uh, Kaseya bit with Intune, that sounds fun. No, no, I think you misunderstand the question. That's like one company and like not that many users. I think Doomsday is more like there's a log for j but this time in like IP tables. <laughs> <laughs> That's a Doomsday device. <laughs> sure. Yeah. I agree. That would be worse. There, yeah. Yeet. <laughs> Close enough. Now you get the truth. <laughs> so, so when you say 1,500 victims, that's 1,500 machines or 1,500 companies. companies. 1,500 companies. Yeah. That so, have so X you're number talking of like machines, and it's American hundred, companies. Times a hundred or times a thousand. Uh, exactly. Potentially, yes. Yeah, that would be uh, a shame. <laughs> <laughs> Any more questions? No, then I guess we'll stop the talk. Then we're done. <laughs>